All right. Well, I'm Steve Robinson. Um, I live in New Haven, Connecticut. And um, the history of the project that I started working on was basically about a month ago, and actually before that, probably a month before that, as I started seeing the increase in the number of uh, potential cases, as everybody did, and started to look downstream at where some potential issues uh, might be and ways that we could solve it. Obviously, we're learning things all the time as we go, uh, but my background is in uh, electronics, technology, software development, and uh, I very much enjoy uh, building uh, devices and technology. So about two months ago, I started to think uh, if there was a shortage of ventilators and if the virus did spread and if there was a need for these things that was uh, critical, what would be the ways that um, people that could source own, their own parts, what capabilities would they have in order to be able to try and uh, manufacture these, these products? And I want to prefix all of this conversation by saying I'm not a medical doctor. All of the work that I'm about to show you is for informational purposes only. If you were to use one of these devices as is, uh, it, have a, it could kill you, uh, injure you terribly. So it's not a medical grade technology. I'm not suggesting that it's for information purposes. And so uh, what I uh, started to look at is were the designs, well, number one is that in if there was a case that there was going to be overwhelming demand for these ventilators and an inability to manufacture those at an output that was needed, uh, what would be the technologies that individuals and small groups could access, um, which they couldn't in previous, obviously, pandemics or even very recently, what pieces could be brought together in order to be able to start to fabricate um, technology, medical devices, or prototypes at least, or caveats before, to be able to uh, fulfill or help with that uh, demand. And specifically, that would be sourcing components and uh, systems that you could get off the shelf, uh, that, in, that small groups and teams without uh, large manufacturing facilities could fabricate and develop. So to that end, I started to look around and research different devices that had already been created. And there was one guy that had created something about 10 years ago called the pandemic ventilator. Mm -hmm. And it was basically uh, the design I've used really builds off that. But I wanted to say, I wanted to understand with the tech, with the parts you can buy now, how hard would it be to fabricate that? Also, he'd been uh, using uh, basically a controller, which was uh, what we call antiquated right now. And I wanted to see if you could refresh the electronic systems with uh, more modern microcontrollers, such as Arduino, um, which is amazing technology and readily available and it costs like $10 for a computer. So it's, you know, what could we do with those pieces? And that was really the backdrop. So I started working on that and started to see how I could develop that. I think, you know, just to, in terms of broadly speaking here, I think probably I'll tell you a few things about what I've done. And then I connected with uh, New Haven IO and uh, maybe Leo could then carry on, you know, with where the New Haven IOs take taken things forward. So basically, my design I can show it you over here if you want to see something working. Or it's fun to see demos, right? Um, is is down here if we get it in view. Da, da, da. Maybe let's slide it over. Let's hope we don't disconnect anything. So basically, here's here's the system balanced precariously on this stool here. And what, what is it? It's basically, it contains uh, a line to a pressure air supply, which goes into one of three valves. These valves are $10 each, um, 15 bucks each. You can, uh, this is the switched on to let the air in, which goes into a reservoir back here. Reservoir is actually sourced from a, um, from a device used to break into cars. I found, found this on Amazon and uh, it supports a good pressure and res resilient, which is what you need for a sort of a bag system. Um, when you get back to talking about sourcing the parts and these kind of projects helping with innovation and, and iteration, which is very important. 
And the air gets fed back there into what would be a patient here. And then it gets bled out back here. Probably not a medical term. The air gets uh, pushed back through here, through this valve. And everything's controlled down here through this Arduino board. And it all runs off 12 volts. So typical car battery kind of voltage. And if you switch it on, you should be able to see it in action. The air is going in here. It's inflating this basically bag, bag of air down here. It gets pushed through and then pushes to the patient and then moves back here. And, and that's really, you know, something like this could be built for $100. So in terms of development for uh, any location, there's a potential for not only being able to source this stuff locally, be able to have it at very reduced costs, and be able to get some technology that potentially could help. So this is really how this system was put together. And what, what did that enable me to do? And what do I think are these kind of projects good for? They're good for being able to start to see what the limitations are and where you would want to improve things. As working through this project, I got connected with uh, Helpful Engineering, which is a Slack group um, of individuals who, uh, Basically, um, sorry, I'm just trying to position my camera here. Hope you don't get ill through the vibrations. Um, and I might actually switch this off so I can hear myself think. Um, anyway, so Helpful Engineering is a group, a Slack group, where, uh, where there's a lot of individuals that came together to try and explore different projects. And I see this as one exploration, a path into looking to see how different people could start to explore different projects. This is one of probably 20, 40, and they're growing numbers of ideas around trying to fill that particular need. Uh, whilst working through this, I discovered a list from the UK Chamber of Commerce, which lists all of the things they would need to accept a device in order to be a ventilator product. And they're probably about 10 different items. Uh, on the GitHub where I've shared the information around this to help support other people that might want to take it forward, uh, I've listed those, those items. And so something like this would really be something that feeds into the next version, which would feed into the next version, which would feed into subsequent versions, which would need to be tested and then um, by medical practitioners who could then okay it against that checklist. Uh, so anyway, that's the sort of status of, of this particular device. But I think uh, what's important to note is there's a reservoir of many capable people and they're interested to help out. This is one particular path forward, but there are many different paths forward. And each investigation enables learning uh, in the community so that we can iterate to find out what products are the best. Um, optimized for the particular needs. And obviously all the things I'm talking about here are just looking at a sort of engineering led process and are not talking about the learnings that have happened over the past month or so around the use of ventilators and when and when they are not, uh, you know, implicable. And just to recap, this is a not medical product. I'm saying no, you should not use this. This is just for investigation and information purposes, but I think it, it helps explore uh, what might be those possibilities moving forward. And through that process, um, I ended up getting interviewed by the New York Times, which sort of raised some awareness, which connected me also. I connected with New Haven IO, which is a group based out of New Haven, close to where I live, um, who have some amazing people and they have some great uh, equipment uh, that people in that community can tap into. And that's how, um, you know, I connected with the group there, and I think the New Haven IO said, okay, ventilators are uh, an interesting and important aspect. You know, what particular project do we want to take forward? Uh, what makes sense now, which was probably about a month after I finished this. And so right now, Laurel is basically pushing forward on that. And I think uh, maybe with that, it'd be good to sort of hand over and find out uh, a little bit more from the New Haven side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. That was cool to hear the backstory. 
Um, my name is Lior. I am the shop manager at Make Haven, a community maker space in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and just to clear up any ambiguity, New Haven IO is a is a New Haven based uh, tech group that you know meets about programming things. Um, and so we we in, interact with them, but we're a, a separate organization. We in normal times have about 400 members. We're open 24 seven. Uh, it's $50 a month to be a member. And we have about 20, 25 instructors who teach people how to do whatever they're trying to do. So we um, try to act as a space to incubate businesses. We have about 10 office spaces in the back where people rent out and work full time. There are a lot of companies and labs that use Make Haven as a shop to make whatever it is that they want to make. If they don't want to have a shop of their own, there are a lot of artists that work out of here and uh, and a lot of hobbyists and tinkers. So we have, in normal times, it's a really bustling place, about 8,000 square feet. We have a whole wood shop over that way, a whole metal shop. Uh, you can see some of the things, well, maybe not much around me. Behind me is, is electronics. Um, we have everything from automated beer brewing to you know, a water jet and, and everything in between. Um, and when it looks like we were going to start shutting down, I was sort of anticipating getting to spend a bunch of time working on the space and getting tools running really well and cleaning things up. And, um, and then it sort of became clear that there were going to be some deficits in our healthcare system that we might be able to help with in some small way. And initially, so, so to Stephen's point, there, there, are, there are a lot of groups there are a lot of people in the world right now trying to be helpful, which is really exciting. There are a lot of engineers as well as healthcare providers. There's one Facebook group in particular that I think was like 70,000 members last time I checked. It was for open source COVID medical supplies. Um, they've done a really good job of curating studies and projects that other people have worked on to help people who want to help figure out what the best way to do that is. Um, and so initially we, we based primarily on their research that uh, had, had been vetted and approved, we decided that the, the best way for us to be helpful was by making face masks. So the, the virus is predominantly carried through droplets. Um, and while an, something like an N95 is certainly better um, than say cotton, cotton's also really good. So we, uh, Initially, we were making some masks here, and then as the clampdown started to get more intense, we started. We made videos, instructional videos. We have um, on drop-off points where you can pick up materials and drop off finished masks. We've worked with local manufacturers to help get the metal strips to go in nose bridges, get elastic, and we now have over a hundred people around the city of New Haven and the greater New Haven area sewing face masks. Uh, which is pretty great. And then we're working with United Way to distribute them to hospitals, to places that need them. Uh, a lot of soup kitchens and shelters and places where individuals need to interact with the community. And we're trying to help them do that slightly more safely. So that's been pretty great. I, I don't know the latest number, but it's certainly north of a thousand masks that have been provided. Um, and then we've also helped organize the long list of projects is, is what I'm getting at. But for the, just to start with masks, because that's where we started. Um, there are also a, a bunch of ways for companies to get in touch with individuals who normally sew as their, as their job, but they're currently out of work, and so to hire them to make masks in bulk for, for their company. Um, and just, just to like run through a quick list of some of the projects we've been working on, there are nasopharyngeal swabs, which are used for testing. There are swabs that get stuck way the heck back in someone's head for for finding the virus, they found that the, the bug tends to live in the nasopharynx, which is the back of your nose, right, let's sort of in line with your ear. Um, and so that's where you want to swab predominantly if you want to get a good culture for testing. So that was a big project working with labs out in California and Massachusetts and at Yale uh, on designing and trying to manufacture swabs. There were intubation shields that we designed in conjunction with physicians at Yale New Haven. Um, we we prototyped really rapidly. I think that we found that our our best role in this is not as a long time manufa long term manufacturer. That like is not something that we focus on in general. We 
we don't have people doing large scale manufacture here and that's not something we're built for. We're built for, for rapid prototyping. And uh, I think that the Intubation Shields is a great example of someone coming to us with a need saying we, we want these boxes. We found some commercially, but they don't work for our beds. They don't work for the tools that we use to intubate patients. So we would like to create something new. So we iterated about two or three times. Luckily the hospital's a few blocks away. So we go over and test on dummies and test on real patients. And finally came up with a set of designs, brought them to a local manufacturer and they're now cranking them out. So people can go to Modern Plastics and uh, and and buy these shields. That's That was a pretty exciting quick turnaround. I uh, just got a call from the physician we were working with today saying that he just picked up another 20 of them and uh, they have an order for 50 that they just placed and that's just for Yale New Haven Hospital. We've also worked with a bunch of other hospitals for that project. Face Shields is one we worked on a bunch. That was in conjunction with the School of Architecture and the Neuroscience Corps at Yale. Um, getting a bunch of volunteers to build face shields. Oh, there's probably a bunch of others. Initially, we uh, looked at the problem of ventilators, which is certainly the most exciting from an engineering standpoint. And uh, the threshold for making a ventilator is very, very high, obviously. And we felt that we wanted to give people like Steven and other people around the world a chance to come up with those designs and do an initial round of prototyping um, because we felt we could be more useful working on other projects initially. And then there came a point a week or two ago where we were like, all right, we're putting a team together to make a ventilator. And um, because obviously we hope this is something that never gets used, but we would rather it gets on the table if it does, if it is needed. And hopefully we just put it on a shelf and it never gets used. Uh, however, I just got off a call with the group that we're working with, whose design we're using, and there were a whole lot of people in that group, and it sounds like there's a whole lot of need around the world. So even if they don't get used at Yale New Haven, there's probably a need for them globally. So the path that we took was, um, again, through an organization that had already looked at, at the data set that had been provided in terms of DIY ventilators. And I'm going to try to share my screen. I probably should have figured out how to do this beforehand. Actions, take presenter. Well, Stephen, do you know how to share the screen? OK, hold on. Uh, what do you need, Lior? I'm trying to share my screen. OK, so uh, are you, let me give you presenter access. I believe you're a moderator right now. No. Okay, now do you see a share screen button? And the, the middle part, a fourth button? Yep. There we cool. go. Boom to bar. Okie dokie. So this is um, a comparison that was put together by this open source COVID-19 group. And these are all of the designs that they looked at for DIY ventilators. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how many it is, but it's a lot. It looks like 100-ish, maybe. Um, and they compared them along a whole bunch of different characteristics that they um, thought were important. And they have a pretty rigorous um, description of, of what is required to get each point, as it were. Um, but not to go too deep into that, what they thought were important was basically, is it buildable? Like, are the designs available and someone could make the thing? Has it been tested? Uh, to, is it suitable for COVID? So if a ventilator, and I'm just going to throw this out quickly just in case this isn't um, something that people know, but a ventilator is a tool that provides artificial respirations for someone when they cannot breathe for themselves. So for whatever reason, you can't breathe either, you know, in more normal cases, it's because you're undergoing surgery. So you need general anesthesia, which deactivates your diaphragm, and you need to be given breaths artificially. So they put an endotracheal tube down your trachea and hook up a machine that provides breaths. In this case, people cannot breathe for other reasons, uh, all sorts of respiratory distress and arrest causes, and the pathologies are obviously complicated. And up. yeah, that's a whole world. But the, the, the part that we're dealing with is trying to make a machine that can provide those breaths. And normally a ventilator is a really complicated machine that can work for all different kinds of patients with all different kinds of problems. What we're trying to do is just make one that's suitable for COVID. So one of the uh, 
um, the things that they were looking for in this comparison was how COVID suitable it is. So the, the number one that you can see is Medtronic's design, and that is a commercially available ventilator made by Medtronic, which is their, one of the branches in, is in North Haven, which is convenient. Uh, and they, they actually made their design open source. However, so that's, that's great. It's not very buildable. So they, um, their designs, while available, are not well suited to building something from that. So we looked at the number two, which is the AmboVent out of Israel. And their design is not as well tested because it's only been developed very recently, but it scored well on all the other uh, things that they were looking for. So that's the one that we decided to pursue. And we've spent the last two weeks, I think, um, making the thing. So we have three teams working on this. There's a mechanical team, electronics, and medical. So medical, we have people from McGill University, from uh, Yale New Haven, and from other organizations that are providing support and consultation in terms of what this device needs to do, what are certain things that it boxes that it needs to check, and what things maybe aren't so important for our purposes. Uh, the mechanical team is, has been working to take the design that's provided by the Ambivent group and iterate on it a little bit to make it as, um, as easily manufacturable as possible. So for example, 3D printing is great for prototyping, but it's not great for manufacture because it's very slow at scale. It's uh, very fast for a one-off compared to building a mold for something, but pretty slow at scale. So we've been trying to transition everything to more manufacturable methods, and we've been working with manufacturers to make sure that we're doing that well. And on the electronic side, we're making sure that all the bells and whistles work. Um, and like I, I said before, the, the the bar that we need to hit for this device is so much higher than for say a face shield. Uh, you know, for, for a face shield, worst case scenario is it doesn't work at all and germs get to the person and maybe they get infected. For a ventilator, if one little resistor on there burns out, I mean, for anyone who's worked with an Arduino, you know, like they work. There's 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 a there's a development process and um, yeah, it's you know it's not it's it's not a traditional medical device that has gone through rigorous testing where people have worked really hard to make sure it can work consistently. And in this case, if someone's taking, I mean, an average number of breaths per minute for two three weeks of ventilation, you're looking at nearly a million cycles. So this needs to work pretty well um, if we want to be able to sleep at night. Um, that said. We are not at a point yet where anyone in the United States has asked for a DIY ventilator um, or one that has not been made by a traditional medical company. Um, we're making this as a just to stay ahead of that need so that if it does arise, we will have something already put together. Um, so I'm just going to show some pictures if that is not the pictures. So this is um, one from another group. So a lot of groups around the world working on this design. And this is one that's just hooked up to a dummy, so I figured it was good to show. And you can see what's happening. It's nothing too crazy. The design is effectively a, so now I'll show you what ours looks like. Um, our, it has the, that Ambu bag, it's pretty loud, which was, it's, it's called a BVM, a bag valve mask, and that's normally used as a tool to provide artificial respirations by hand for a short period of time. But in this case, we're using that as the component that's providing the breaths for relatively long term. Uh, it is squeezed by this arm that comes down, and then you can control some of the, uh, some of, you know, some of the, the things that are controlling the air that's going to the patient. And um, and it obviously doesn't have all the controls that a traditional ventilator does, but it has a whole bunch and the ones that have been determined to be the most useful. So those include breaths per minute, how quickly breaths are being provided, how large those breaths are, it's called the tidal volume, uh, the maximum pressure on inspiration. So let's say someone has some problem that you know, either it's called compliance or they have a pneumothorax, any kind of problem that would cause their lungs to not be able to receive as much air, so it would drive up the pressure on a breath. Uh, you set the max pressure it's willing to provide. 
Um, and then you also using a separate valve that goes on the exhaust filter, set the peak, which is the positive and expiratory pressure. So that's the pressure that's holding the alveoli open even on an exhale. So uh, it's, it's pretty bare bones. We've been using, I'll just click through some other pictures because they're kind of cool. This is a mold we made for making the arm goes in the middle. So we initially 3D so, printed and then we cast into the silicone mold. This is a little 3D printed part uh, we probably went through six iterations of to adapt an oxygen hose to go to the pressure sensor to determine the pressure being provided by the ventilator. Uh, this is a Mark Forge 3D printer printing that mold, the positive to make the negative mold. This is a water jet that we have in the metal shop that's cutting out the metal for the body. And this is an unrelated head strap we made to, uh, it's a modification of a design that we found online to take the tension from an N95 off people's necks and, and tops of their heads. These are some of them printing on a printer. This is a CAD drawing. So what we got from the Israeli team was a bunch of CAD drawings in terms of the mechanical end. And so we had to look at that and make a bunch of changes and before going over to the water jet and to the other tools to, to make them. This is Justin uh, etching a PCB for our first iteration of the control board before we got them commercially made. This is Hannah wearing a face shield. This is our intubation shield getting used by Dr. Van Tonder at Yale New Haven. So that's obviously a simulation dummy that he's testing it on. A bunch of face shields. These are the masks that were one design of the masks that we're having made around New Haven. These are some respirators that we got to anesthesiology. A bunch of foam. Uh, Something that's been really interesting is, is sourcing things. I mean, the normal supply chains are being stressed really intensely. And uh, while we're ahead of the curve in terms of being able to prototype really rapidly, as soon as one design gets out there that, that people like, every possible supplier of that is getting, is getting strained pretty intensely. So getting the foam, getting the elastic, getting each component gets more difficult. This is a, one of the designs of the swabs that we are looking at. It says rayon wrapped around a, uh, nylon tip. So for that project, it needs to be uh, certain kinds of materials that won't inhibit the PCR that is used to determine if the virus is in, in the swab material. That's just a swab in a container. Printer. And those might be just a few of the pictures that I grabbed. Um, so our plan forward is uh, to take this device and I'm just going to unshare my screen. Stop sharing screen. How about it? Uh, and so, yeah, our hope is to, to iterate this device a little bit more, uh, primarily with the goal of making sure that it's, it's producible at scale and then taking it further, not only so in parallel with, with the hospital, making sure that it is something that they would like, uh, and then looking at the approval process, which they're already pursuing in Israel, um, and then figuring out how we can make that in conjunction with, with our work here in the United States, and uh, and then working with manufacturers to, to get, get this thing cranking, um, both as a preventative, or not a preventative, but as, a, as a, something we could do uh, as a premature measure we could take um, in case it is needed in the future, and then for something we can look at as a, a tool that could be used globally because there are a lot of places that can't afford even one $50,000 ventilator, no less a whole bunch of them that, that might be needed. Um, again, as Stephen was saying, this is just one of many, many designs. Another design that I was looking at yesterday is entirely plastic injection molded. So they use compliant mechanisms. So they're just little pieces of plastic that can bend back and forth. So you can take this whole design put it in a plastic injection molder and just, I mean, really crank them out. I mean, you could be you could be cranking out lots of them at that rate. Uh, it's obviously simpler and it may have other problems that, that turn up, but I think that's a really exciting route to be pursued. Um, ours is obviously, it's closer to maybe $500 per unit, but that's that's a chunk of money and there, there are components that can break and have problems and be difficult to replace. And uh, those could all be, be game stoppers. And if you can't, find a replacement part wherever you are, then that $500 thing that is expensive to you is now broken and, and a liability. 
versus you know a five dollar plastic injection molded one maybe slightly less good but if it's super cheap and doesn't break then that's that's a winner so um yep so we've we've just been kind of cranking away i'm i've been incredibly grateful for working in a place where we have all of these tools um for working at a at an organization that supports all the staff, the two other staff, in addition to myself, I'm the shop manager. There's J.R. Logan, who's the director, and Kate Siebeck, who's the operations manager, and all of us are working on different facets of these projects. And uh, at a board level and an organizational the director level, both have been really supportive of us working on these projects that aren't directly bettering Make Haven, necessarily, in a, in a, in a really linear way. Uh, and then we also have about 400 members who continue to pay monthly dues to support these projects, even though they can't come in and use the space. So those are all really um, incredible things that I'm grateful for and, and touched by and are the only way that I'm able to do any of these things and um, the only way that I can ask for other volunteers to, to help with any of these projects. Um, so I'm obviously excited to see how this particular project progresses. I'm happy to take any questions. I don't know what, um, yeah, that's, sure. that's my bit. Um, so um, I guess, Stephen, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, I already interrogated Lior the other day for a video, <laughs> by the way, which I'll share in the chat. Um, it'll take us a couple of days to get this video out there, probably. Um, so Stephen, um, you know, obviously you assembled this um, relatively quickly. Um, you gave all the caveats about it, and it was sort of a, a learning experience for you. Do you recommend uh, people try to do this for that reason, sort of to learn um, the mechanics of this, to learn more about how you, just the fundamental principle of the device works? Well, I mean, I think doing projects like this, uh, can provide learning on many different levels, right? So there is, as Leo mentioned before, building a ventilator is an incredibly difficult thing to do with limited resources and time being one of those resources, right? So, um, you know, if you think about one of these commercial products, it could have taken 10 years, 20 years, person years of effort, so that's say 2,000 hours, just to put it into context, 2,000 hours per, per person year. So it's 20,000, 40,000 hours worth of real engineering, not just sitting around eating pizza and having some coffee. I'm sure some of that happened along the way, hopefully keep them engaged. But uh, so, you know, what we're doing here is trying to, uh, is, is gonna be, has to be taken in context of that, right? So if you say, this is, uh, this is the, what we're competing against in terms of medically professionally produced technologies, what you can do on a sort of few individuals, I think it's amazing what has been done. You know, I mean, obviously mine's a sort of prototype down one line. I mean, the work that Leo and Make Haven and all of the supporters of Make Haven should be highly commended, both from all of the various things that they're doing to support uh, the medical community and indirectly uh, all of ourselves, right? So. Um, I think there's things that you can do to help support the big push, which is get technologies like this uh, innovated so that uh, they can uh, make a difference. And, and in part of that is if you think of those number of hours to produce a, a professional technology, if, if you can sort of take each person's step as being carrying the baton once around the track and handing it on to the next person, you know, I think the challenge of the this open source kind of community work is how to harness all those individuals and all that capacity in an effective way, right? So, you know, I'd say uh, in terms of doing something like this is you can't have any learning if you don't do anything, right? So, you know, maybe I cranked this out a few months ago and it turns out that there's uh, that this is the way to go. And I, I think it probably isn't considering that maybe the Amboy bag is like, seems to be a more effective way to go. Uh, that seems to be a design that's sort of come out as being one of the leaders, which has that great aspect of there's the reduced risk because it's basically bag squeezing. I mean, it's much more complicated than that, but, but uh, you can see how you're not sort of injecting pressures and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, but each thing that one works on is solving a problem and, and, and reducing the difficulty of producing that device, right? So, I mean, on a, on, a, uh, on a large scale, I think you do this, you learn things, you learn about components, you share that on GitHub, you put a lot of asterisks all over it, and maybe that can help someone else inspire them, have an idea, take that forward. But, you know, uh, I think that's on the big push. I think on the small push, there's a wonderful educational opportunity around this time to see what technologies there are, how to play with those, uh, how, to, how to learn about that, how to be connected with other people that are interested in these things, because maybe there's other things that shared and collective individuals coupled with open source will be solving as we go forward, right? So I think, uh, you know, in that way, uh, Make Haven, Lior and his team can always take people that have capabilities and help move those forward. So I think there's like those different levels that you can think about. Sure, and I'm, I'm glad you talk about the distributed nature of that collaboration. I, th I think one of the challenges um, as far as free and open source software goes, uh, which is the area I more or less work in these days, um, is you know what used to be called drive-by contributors, right? Um, contributors who are episodic and are doing things for, you know, one one purpose, uh, one day, one event, or something. Um, do you see this uh, because it's a crisis, and because the assumption is, and the hope is, that we get past this pandemic um, at some point? Um, do you think that um, it will be kind of episodic in that way, that contributors will, will sort of vanish? Or do you feel that the um, effects will be lasting in some way? Well, I mean, you look at open source software, right? Um, I think people, a lot of open source gets pushed forward because there are organizations that have funding to pay people full time and it benefits them to share some parts of their code, right? Parts which aren't unique to their business model that they can, and by doing that, everybody everybody wins, right? Um, and then there's some people that contribute on nights and weekends base, basis, right? But And they're doing the best they can with the resources that they can in terms of time, but they're just not gonna have the capacity that someone's paid full time to work on this. So if you take that kind of observation of open source software development and apply it to the hardware community, maybe that's one way of looking at it. I think, um, so I would say from individuals who have full-time other jobs that they can't walk away from without destroying their ability to support their, <laughs> their families, uh, you know, it gives them a way to connect at that level. But then for other organizations, I think it's a wake-up call that there is, all of these people that potentially could start sharing these ideas uh, and sharing hardware designs, which I think uh, may well start to become more established. I would be very, I wouldn't be surprised if through developing these uh, devices that engineers and people that were interested in that uh, started forming medical device companies which had a much stronger leaning on open source and a much stronger ethos around contributing to open source. So it may well be that uh, without a, a situation like this, you wouldn't have had such a strong, I'm not just saying it's a good thing, but I'm just looking for silver linings um, and observations. I think it's a, it could be a very interesting um, way that open source hardware and medical hardware uh, starts to become more uh, accepted or integrated, probably peripherally at first, but then over time, if you have, say, people developing medical device technology companies, which which uh, have a, have a strong cultural buy into an open source mentality. Cool. And Lior, any comments on that, or what are your feelings? Um, I mean, I think we've we've certainly benefit like. If we had to design this thing from the bottom up, it would uh, we wouldn't be here right now. Uh, so I think that I think an interesting question that came up was was initially on one of the first phone calls I had with the Israelis that developed this. Um, was it occurred to me like, oh, like I I had approached this like we were going to design this thing for manufacture and hand it off to what I then just realized was like an like a, a, for-profit manufacturer who's going to take this and sell this thing. 
And um, so then I had to ask the Israeli team, like, hey, like just just as like a sanity check, it's okay if I if we like give this to a company to sell and make money on, right? And like, oh yeah, like that's the idea. We that's why we made it open source. Um, and that was just an interesting moment for me to be like, oh wow, that's really that's pretty cool that you are willing to make this thing that you know other people are going to profit off of because that is what the world needs right now. Um, and I think that that was not that at any point I really felt like we were doing anything terribly novel or anything that we were going to try to profit off of. But I think that was just like it really set it in my in my psyche that we were this was just a hundred percent open. Like any anything that we did, we were going to try to disseminate as as well and freely as we could. Um, I think there's definitely a role, like obviously as someone who's trying to manage this, I it's great when someone can commit a whole chunk of time, um, but there are also a bunch of discrete projects that that you know um, someone who hops in for a few hours can can be really helpful for um, when you're just solving one problem. Um, as as we progress, things start get kind of interwoven, and it's hard to tackle things independently. Um, but I think having people who can jump in and 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 work on a on a discrete problem is 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 a great asset. Um, and I mean, I think that something that that could be cool potentially in the future is I mean, I never I don't want to live in in a world where anyone is relying on me or or make haven a a, a community maker space for producing medical supplies. Like that is just ridiculous. Um, I also think that some, by virtue of our size and tooling and and nature, we can prototype really rapidly. And so, something that this might engender in the community for the future is a spirit of building things here that are for civil society, that are better for public use uh, versus just for private individual use, because it you know can put in people says, yeah, you can you can make things that are actually used, and we can iterate and prototype really quickly, and then maybe do some production here, but also bring it to larger scale production and do the kind of iterative prototyping that'd be really hard to do at a bigger company. I mean, we, when we were working on the face shields, we would talk with a bunch of bigger companies that members of ours work at, and they would say like, oh yeah, this big company is trying to make face shields and they're making like 15 a day uh, because of the methods that they use. Um, and it costs a bunch of money and, and whatnot. We're cranking out hundreds a day uh, just by virtue of the fact that we are, are able to iterate a little faster and, and maybe be a little more creative because we're more nimble. Um, and so I think that that is a cool capability to have in communities around the country. Like, even though the United States may be really feeling the impact of not having a lot of local manufacturing right now, we could have more maker spaces in the future and more people who feel empowered to make things at a local scale, uh, certainly to prototype at a local scale. And I think that could be a big benefit in the future, in, even in non-pandemic times, just, you know, hey, a, a street light could be improved, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the thing around town may be, people might feel that they could play a role in improving that uh, after being involved in some of these projects. And, and that's pretty exciting. I think that, that the idea that that either you know governments or or companies or these big entities that are impenetrable is like it's not you live in a city made up of humans and there are companies made of humans and you can as another human being come up with ideas that can contribute and improve um, and I think that's highlighting it I mean for us to have video calls with representatives from the city and from Yale New Haven Hospital and have them say we want the things that you're making <laughs> is uh, both terrifying and empowering uh, and I think that while I hope that they find suppliers that can make things in clean rooms to really good specifications. Um, I'm also, it, it is a pretty cool feeling when someone who in that kind of position comes to you and says, we would like you to make this thing for us. And I hope that that feeling can transition on into more normal times and people can, can use that for good. Sure, I'm sure you're not the only one, right? <laughs> I'm hoping too that uh, that transition happens. <laughs> I'm starting to get uh, a little worried. But um, anyway, in the, in the chat, maybe, you know, it depends on the day and the moment. Um, 
So there's some uh, talk about, you know, best ways to help, uh, maybe besides donations and, and money. Um, but, you know, obviously that's something you can talk about. Um, but could you also talk about uh, pro processes that you're working on? So uh, maybe using casting instead of 3D printing, mm. um, those kind of volume production things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that, I mean, I, I, the last time I saw Steven's design was weeks ago. And after having worked on our project for the past few weeks, I now am seeing the beauty in his design even more, uh, just from its simplicity and from the locally sourceable parts uh, and the fixability and how, how clear the functionality is. Someone could look at it and probably figure it out. Um, and not that ours is terribly complicated, but it's, it's more complicated and difficult to fix and make. Uh, I, so that's, you know, that's just, and then there's um, further along that spectrum is, um, well, the two ends is something like a Medtronic design and the other end is a injection molded design. Uh, to make ours, we used a water jet to cut out the sheet metal and the plate metal. Uh, a water jet takes water, pumps it to about 30,000 pounds per square inch. And in this case, mixes it with an abrasive with garnet. So it becomes like liquid sandpaper <clears throat> and shoots and will cut anything under the sun. So it may take longer, the harder and thicker it is, but it will cut it. And um, so in this case, we use predominantly aluminum and it cut through. It's, I mean, it, it's it's really incredible tool that we got through a state grant and now we are using a lot, um, putting it through its paces. And um, yes, yeah, so that, that, one's, that one's pretty exciting. It's really easy to iterate pretty quickly. It doesn't make gases so versus like plasma or laser that have, they put a lot of heat into the part, for example, and they uh, need, some can only work on metal like this. This just works on everything. So it's been really great. It lets us do all kinds of cool shapes and designs that would just be really difficult on any kind of manual manufacturing technique. Clamping these things on a mill would be really difficult. Um, so that's a great tool. Uh, I have a whole bunch of videos, uh, and there should be some on our Instagram and Facebook and whatnot of, of that. We also, for anyone who's interested on makehaven.org, have all of the projects listed out, if anyone wants to dive into those. The 3D printing is incredible for rapid prototyping. So we come up with CAD models and can have it printed out in anywhere between an hour and you know however many hours, depending on, on the part, and we can test it. And if we like it, then we you know move on with it. If we don't, then we can reiterate. Uh, we have a bunch of different kinds of printers. Um, we have FDM printers, which are like hot glue guns that move around and just squirt melted plastic out. We have some fancy, we have a fancy one called a Mark Forged, which it prints in nylon with embedded carbon fiber. So that uh, is stronger and has really nice resolution. Um, and then once we make something that we like, uh, one option is to cast it. So the way we've we've been casting, I'll just grab the molds. Sorry about that. Is first we 3D printed these guys, and they're just black and white because we printed on different machines in different colors. And these are the positives. So this is half each half of what the piece, the final piece you want to look like is. And then we put them in a cardboard box and poured silicone into it and let that silicone dry. And that made these blocks of rubber. So then these peel off. And now we have these two blocks of silicone rubber. And then these fit really nicely together, just like that. And then in the top, we have a hole. And then you pour in the liquid plastic. So you pour the plastic in there, you let it dry, it cures in, in minutes. It's really, really fast. It generates a lot of heat while it's doing that. Um, and then you peel it off and take out your, your piece. Um, so this took, say, a day to make, which is obviously longer than 3D printing a part. But now we can make a part every five minutes, which is far faster. So that's sort of like step one of ramping up production. And then the next step would be plastic injection molding which is making a mold out of steel or maybe aluminum and injecting plastic into it. And so that would take a bunch more money and time to make the mold, but then you could really rapidly and cheaply crank out those parts. So that's sort of like the production to manufacture process for 
for that type of piece. Um, for the electronics, we initially breadboarded, and then we went to a proto board uh, briefly, and then we got boards that were made from uh, some some PCB manufacturer that cranks them out 24 hours and then ships them. Uh, in this case, from China, so it took a little while to get here, but at that point, we were ready for them. Uh, this is one board that just happened to be sitting here that has some components that we soldered onto it. And then we attach some sensors. So in this case, the sensors are a rotary magnetic encoder that detects the position of the arm. And it sits right at the fulcrum. And then we have a pressure sensor for measuring the pressure close to the patient's lungs. Uh, and then we have a bunch of inputs going in. So potentiometers controlling the various values that we want to set, some buttons, and then there's some lights and alarms and whatnot. So for example, if the patient, if the tube comes off, so it detects no pressure, an alarm goes off. It, if it detects high pressure because there's some coughing, some some something blocking air, then an alarm goes. There are a few other situations that are really bad and a patient could die quickly if it's not addressed where an audible alarm goes off. Um, we, uh, yeah, I mean, it was pretty interesting working from a design that had been provided to us. So there are a bunch of things that we wanted to modify. Just, just it just didn't. For, you know, for whatever reason, we thought we could do it better. And in some cases we were right, in some cases we weren't. Uh, and it's it's sort of, it's a weird feeling to just have to trust a design to be like, nope, we're just gonna do it this way. Even if it doesn't quite feel right, we're, we're gonna go with it because we just wanna make one that is representative of the initial design. Um, and yep, so we, we've iterated a whole bunch of times and, and we've forked a little bit from the original design, both in terms of mechanical and Electronics, but it's it's you know really the same beast. I'm just I'm just looking over at it now. So I've actually disassembled it to work on some pieces. So it's a little open up open up. There's a bunch of them laying around, but um, uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 a fairly simple thing. There are a lot of pieces from McMaster, so we just kind of chose McMaster as a supplier for most of the parts. Um, that's obviously not something that everyone around the world will have access to necessarily but they do have everything and they have it quickly and we have tried to make things as uh, generic as possible there are no really crazy parts on here that you couldn't get um, and we haven't bought any parts that they don't have a lot of in stock so if a bunch of people wanted to start making them they certainly could um, and yeah I mean there, there have probably been other techniques the lasers probably been used um, sewing machines for the nylon strap. We've certainly thrown up some things on, on a mill. Um, and then there's been a whole bunch of electronics works using oscilloscopes and clamp meters and whatnot. So that's been, that's been most of it in terms of manufacturing this thing. Very cool. Um, so I think that's a good note to sort of uh, end on. Thank you for showing uh, the pieces there. Even yeah. that's very amazing to me that you guys are uh, working on this. It's incredible. Um, Stephen, before we go, is there anything you want to sort of plug and let people know that you're uh, working on? Um, well, you know, I, what I'd like to plug, and I'm not affiliated with Make Haven, but I've seen them grow from a small thing to a bigger thing, is I think it's just wonderful what they're doing with the resources that they have right now. And that's basically something that uh, they should get a lot of recognition for because it's affecting and helping everybody, not only in Connecticut, but in, in the world at large. Because one way of looking at it is these kind of de designs, ideally we don't want them to be used, right? But really what that is, is like an insurance policy and they're writing that policy. And the people that are supporting writing that policy are the make haven supporters, people that would normally be able to go in the shop, but they didn't, but they still keep paying, and they're supporting this work. So there's a real big difference being made by those people through Make Haven. So I think that to me is like uh, really cool. I think it would be great if instead of bailing out banks, we mm -hmm. could skim a, 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 a sliver of a sliver of a sliver off to support community efforts like this, because it's not, as it, it is an insurance check, right? That someone's writing. And um, yeah, I think I think hats off to 
uh, Lord, JJR, and all of the other people that are pushing that forward because, you know, building the product and continuing to build a product, it's not like it's just a can of beans and you pull it off the shelf. It's like each person that gets their hand on it and who changes it and, and, and sees how it works for them improves that product. And that can be fed back into the community. And also, as people coalesce around the product, you get um, more work on, hey, this piece, we don't have like a this kind of cut, water jet cutter or whatever. We could do it this way. So people find out several different ways to build the casing. People find several different ways to create the arm, several different ways to come up with a controller board. And this supports an ecosystem around a product that then is, then is uh, adaptable for any different person or group that wants to take that forward. So, you know, if I'm going to plug anything, I think it's Make Haven. I think they're doing a fantastic job, and I think we all owe them a debt for that. That's very, very sweet. It was a lot with your inspiration, so. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I hope, I hope at the end of the day, this turns into a, into a, uh, a balloon blowing device for parties, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, it, but, but if that it's doesn't great. happen, you know, I think it's the efforts of all these uh, people that uh, I'm very excited to be connected with. That's a perfect, inspiring note to end on. Very positive. And Lior, just a quick question. Are you watering all those plants? Uh, there's actually an automated watering system. So I don't know if you can, I can't see it, but there's a green little tube going all around and twice a week it squirts water on the plants. So they're Fair. well taken care of. Nice. Thank, Thank you, you both. Watching out for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean, for hosting this as well.